Well, uh, yesterday, obviously, the opening of the fall evaluation right. period. Coaches out and around all over the place uh, looking at guys. Dane Fife was at Lala Muir uh, watching 2023 four-star point guard Jeremy Fears. Um, other schools that were there were Syracuse, Duke, and Notre Dame. Noah Clowney's final four programs, Alabama, Indiana, Virginia Tech, and Florida, all were expected to see uh, him play yesterday. We're expected to see him play yesterday, I should say. Uh, Austin Parks, also from 2023. He is expected to have Indiana amongst uh, other schools th in this weekend to see him. He, uh, he's got an IU offer from this summer. Um, so there's just tons going on, man. Um, let's see. Indiana is – oh, Kwame Evans, you got uh, an offer. He's expected uh, to see him – this week, he got the offer, I think it was Tuesday night that he got that. Mike Woodson is off to see 2023 cathedral four-star Xavier Booker. I guarantee you he is – That's that. I think that's probably a personal one for, for Mike Woodson, not for any reason other than he's a hell of a player. Uh, Jim, do. yeah, he's just <laughs> – you do not, I again. We've we've had this discussion. I'm not quite there yet, but um, I, oh yeah, I, I I'm high on him early, and but you do get a sense of priority from the staff as to who they're looking at, and and a lot of people will try to make it who they watch the first day, who they watch. You know, it, there's no. It certainly is whoever they watch within the first week, especially they're either a priority or somebody they're truly trying to get a feel for. Like, what is this guy like in a, in a in a workout environment, in a practice, and well, mainly in a practice environment, uh, because now even high school coaches have a little bit more, especially in Indiana, have a little bit more latitude on what they can do in the off season and and provide a little bit more than, like you know, probably six or seven years ago, this would that would would just been an open gym and like the school coach wouldn't have had any any um, they would not have been permitted to really have a whole lot of instruction on the floor during this time of year, but that has changed recently. And in my opinion, it's changed for the better. It, it lets coaches get their uh, get a little bit more working with their players, with their team in this instance, a lot like what college has done. But it also allows these guys to provide more structure for when college coaches come in, and it's not just some loose environment. So, Well, there's just tons going on. Uh, it's, I'm – while they're trying to get practice, keep practice rolling as the season is about here that you mentioned to to get have to get back out on the road, I would imagine this. What's that? Every school goes through it and deals with it, but I would imagine this would be a better, different time that they would rather be doing this. Well, yeah, but it's I don't know sure, but when you know, I mean, this yeah. is it's it's after Labor Day, yeah. so regardless of when a, a school's calendar, a high school's calendar starts, or even. Or even an NCAA calendar started. I mean, Ohio State, I think, aren't they still on quarters and they're not even in school yet, are they? Um, there, there's some language that in terms of when a college program, a Division One program can start doing workouts, it's, it is the first day of classes or September 15th, whichever comes first. So I remember for a while, I don't know if Ohio State's changed, but for a while there, Ohio State was at a disadvantage when that rule first became – or when the rules started to shift, when college coaches could work uh, a little with their team a little bit sooner. But but right now, each player gets four hours a week of an, of, of sport work, of skill work, and a lot of a lot of schools will break that into two one hour workouts, either individually or in small groups, and then they will have a like a one two hour practice in a given week. That's what a lot of teams do. I don't know what IU structure is, but that is, that's what a lot of guys do. I remember I used to cover Florida and that was very similar. That's what they did with yeah. their, they would do the, the two uh, hour practices. And, stuff. and it used to be, when it first changed, it used to be two hours. And, and this was, um, and I, I do, because of where I live, I spent a lot of time at Butler watching their stuff and, and they would do um, two 30 minute workouts and, and then an hour practice. And then those guys would be able to come and go in their, well, what they would call their practice facility now, which back then would have just been called the West Gym. Uh, you know, those guys had a lot of access in there, and they would go in and basically do some individual stuff together. So, what are your thoughts about the talent level in the state? Where is it now? Um, I know Archie and the previous administration made a big push of recruiting in state, and obviously got Trace Jackson Davis and Romeo Langford. Where is it maybe now compared to three or four or five years ago? Well, I think it's. It, 
look, 2022 is pretty top heavy. I don't know how deep it is. 2023 is probably the flip. It's very deep. I'm not sure how top heavy it is. Um, you know, that's obviously stuff, something like that is definitely a matter of opinion, but, but it's, there have been some stretches where there's been a lot of, a lot of really good players come through the state and I'm sure I'll, I can miss some and, but, but it's not been the kind of guys that you can completely bankroll a class on by just sticking in the state of Indiana, especially, you know, with competition from Purdue Butler's now a high major program. Um, you know, so you've got those types of obstacles that didn't used to be in the way, especially the Butler element to it. Um, but this, you know, and 2022, with the exception of Leland Walker, who was transferred out of state to a prep school, is is pretty picked over from a high major perspective. Uh, the 2023 class, uh, there, there's still, in my mind, some proving to do. And I still think there's a couple of under the radar guys that uh, that have a chance to, to sneak into that level. This time of year, uh, it's... I guess it's not any different than the summertime, but the kids are all, they're in school now. Uh, does that change how they prepare, change how their the coaches see them? Because it's a different environment, team structure. You've gone from an AAU uh, structure right. to a high school structure, which they're different because on the AAU team, you're probably one of guys that, that are at your level on the high school team, you may be the guy. So it changes your role a lot and how you're well, seen. The structure element too is, is vital. I mean, that's what they, I mean, that's why, I mean, I, as much as I believe the AAU season is, is where most of these guys start their recruiting or get, get a jump start to their recruiting. It still has to be funneled through the schools because the schools obviously provide the academic information, the schools, provide teachers that work with these kids on a daily basis to get some input as to what type of student he is, what type of person he is in the classroom. A good college coach will talk to a, a player's teachers to get a feel for what they're like. And then you also have the structure of the school practice and the ability to get into, I mean, I can't tell people, I mean, I'm a, as big of a Carmel homer as, as, as it is. And, and as much as, you know, colleges will call me about Carmel kids, I can't get them in the school. They, they have to go talk to coach Osborne. And everything at that point has to be run through him. And that's the way it should be, you know? And and that's why, I mean, like earlier, Jim, you asked the question of, is there a better, you know, college coaches would probably rather be with their team right now. But there is, there aren't a whole lot of better times a year to see a kid that you like and get a feel for what he's like in a workout environment than this time of year. Um, you know, an answer, a question Kevin asked me, about my background, a little bit about my background uh, when we were off before we got on the air here. When I first started coaching back in the early to mid nineties, college coaches could come to our AAU practices. And that's how I got to know a guy like coach Felling and how I got to know a guy like coach Dockage because those guys could come and Felling would come up to Carmel every now. One year we, I was with a program called Bloomington Red and one year we practiced at Bloomington South and coach Knight came, you know, and that was, nerve wracking for me as a, as a big IU fan and, and certainly as a big Bob Knight fan. And, you know, that was as much of an honor as it was, it was nerve wracking and there. And he made some pretty stern evaluations of some kids and, and shared them damn near on the spot. Um, as soon as, almost as soon as practice was over about what he thought about this kid, that kid, you know, he was looking at three guys and, you know, a couple of them didn't make the cut after that practice. And I kind of felt bad for it, but, but now the only element they get it, college coaches get a chance to see kids practice and truly prepare is during this time of year when they're working with their school coaches. And that's to me, that's why it's a, a vital time of year. You brought up Leland well, Walker earlier, and um, it's kind of interesting because we watched him in the Indiana uh, All Star game in June up in Brownsburg, and uh, he yeah. looked like the best player on the court. I mean, he was terrific. Yeah. He's 5'11. Five, he's are coaches yep. too obsessed with size when it comes to backcourt? I mean, I've seen plenty of – I mean, Billy Donovan uh, at Florida used to love small guards. And uh, right. he, he won a national championship with Torian Green at 6'1 and Lee Humphrey at 6'2. Well, and but see, 6'1, 6'2. Big difference still, between that and 5'11. There is a big difference, especially the 6'2. And here's the other thing too, Kevin, is 
is sometimes it is an issue of length and wingspan and, and whether you're a plus or, or a minus or, or a, a neutral. And they, they look at wingspan as much as they do height. Um, you know, and, and look, Leland's, Leland was, has been viewed as small, and I think that's fair. His jump shot had been viewed as inconsistent up to a point. That has changed, in my opinion. When I saw him play in, in the spring, which I, I tried to get a chance to do quite a bit, and definitely when I saw him play in June with, with still North Central playing in the league up here at Westfield at, at Grand Park, their school team league, his, his jump shot had become extremely fluid compared to what I saw during the school year. I think the last time I saw him play a school game was early January. So I went, what, nearly four months in between watching him play, um, and his jump shot looked vastly different between those two times and looked even a little bit better in June than what I saw in early or mid, mid-April. So, you know, I think the size is an issue because, you know, the, but then also if the shooting isn't there, that's sort of two strikes against you, even though you're, in his case, just hyper, hyper athletic. Um, his feel for the game has improved. That He made that leap going into his sophomore year. I thought his command of possessions and command of the ball was a lot better than when he was as a freshman, which which makes sense. Um, but some some guys don't get that until they get to college. I, I thought he had it pretty early, but I think it was the combination of size and jump shot. And look, some coaches some coaches like bigger guards. Some coaches don't care as much. Uh, Woody coming from the NBA, I, I could see him thinking, okay, will Leland Walker will they scout that out? In, in a you know in, in a scouting report, I know Coach Miller, you know Archie wasn't recruiting him as heavily as what a couple of his assistants wanted. Not even remotely close uh, as what a couple of his his assistants wanted. He wanted well, bigger Archie guards. Was such a great judge of talent, obviously. Well, which the irony is, is that Archie was definitely not a bigger guard, and Archie was definitely a successful point guard. You're not big at on the much. High major level. Huh? Yeah, he, he wasn't big on much. Right, but well, then that could be. But he's you know it's still. Sometimes coaches will just make that decision. I want a bigger guard. Of course, sometimes too, Kevin, it also depends on who's who's back there with him. You know, if you've got good size at the two and the three, especially, you can get away with a smaller guard. Um, if, but if you don't, then you're really putting yourself in a in a position where um, you you can kind of get bullied in the backcourt. And um, yeah, and plus, know, Woodson Woodson's a guy that wants to switch on defense too, and I'm sure that create right. that would create all sorts of matchup problems as well. Yeah. He's trying to create a, a positionless team almost, and well, and you can't. Yeah, you're right, Kevin. You you can't. It's hard to have a a five ten five eleven guard if you get switched off onto a six eight wing, and that's very easily to have happen uh, no, from you, a, with can, a one and a three. And you can switch in tiers. You can create switching switching groups where two threes and four switch, or you know, and the college kids are. Although I know, you know, anytime you do that, you do leave a lot more room for air. But college kids are smart enough to figure that out. We've done that at the summer level where we've we've switched two through four a lot, you know, because we've got personnel to do that. But but again, the Kevin's question with the size, look at how much Yogi look how much Yogi Ferrell struggled as a freshman against Syracuse's zone, and how much link they're able to put out on the court with that team, especially, and even even surrounded by a, a, a group of veterans. Uh, they, I mean, Indiana struggled because their point guard, who was again, Yogi was a freshman, so you give him a little bit of extra leeway there. But when in the real time, when winning the game actually matters, his size became an issue because he couldn't get around that length. I'm not great at predicting recruiting because uh, it's just a guessing game. Uh, I'm not talking to these kids on a daily basis, but Caleb Glenn, uh, the kid from Louisville. I, I think that Indiana, and I'll even mention this because I. It's just blowing my mind. But I think that Indiana may be in the best position for him. And I just never would have imagined a kid from Louisville, you know, getting past Louisville and Kentucky both. But Kentucky is not real. I don't know that they were recruiting him at all or the Harlot and then Louisville is. But they've got issues, man. They've just got issues that have to catch up to them. They still are waiting to be punished for the FBI stuff. And now you've got other things that have happened. So your current coach is on a six game suspension. I just, I, I can see parents 
at home going, son, that's only an hour and a half away. That's a hell of a school. Maybe you should go there, uh, blah, 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 whatever. But the staff, I, I think that what is Louisville staff is, is a staff of dysfunction. You, you got one coach suing another. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to be. I'm not trying to pick on Louisville. I'm just, it's just a fact. And, but I don't know how that's conducive to great recruiting. Who the hell wants to send their kid to that? I mean, this is a pattern that has gone on at this school through coaches, through administrations. And so that has got to catch up with them, I, I would imagine. But well, I, I think Mac walked into a rough situation, basically. And yeah, you know, but you gotta your and, job is to clean that up. True. True, but that's not your always. job is the first not is to get in trouble is the first thing you don't do, and that's exactly what he's done. But was Louisville willing to bottom out like Indiana did? That's you know, and, and was it necessary? I mean, you know, you just that's look, Cream came in, everybody's under this mis you know, this misperception that Cream came into an empty cupboard. No, Cream came in and emptied it. Yeah, you know, he did, and and people were fine with that. Um, to the point where they forgot that he did that. And I have, I mean, one of them was my, you know, one of them was a kid that played for me and I didn't blink one bit from a, from a fan perspective. I felt bad for the kid. I, but, but to a, to a point you, you know, you make your own circumstances. Um, I don't know that Matt goes into that situation at Louisville and decides to do that. Now it doesn't excuse anything else that's happened. And the, the Godino thing with him is just strange because they, they have history before Louisville. I mean, good history before Louisville and it's got a couple of, friends of mine and the basketball friends that used to work with Godino and everybody's just like either acting confused or totally confused or just basically just soft handing it and like yeah. not really wanting to talk too much about it other than it's just bizarre.